A recent geological study published in Nature has sparked excitement and surprise by revealing that one of the stones at Stonehenge, known as the Older Stone, originated from northeastern Scotland, or Orkney, over a thousand kilometres away along the most direct route. This revelation changes previous assumptions about the stone's origin and sheds new light on the ancient monument's construction. The Older Stone, a visible red sandstone, was long thought to have come from the Brecon Beacons in Wales, the closest known source of red sandstone. This assumption was logical given that the other type of stone used at Stonehenge is the Priscilla Bluestone, also sourced from Wales. Even this relatively nearby source required a monumental effort to haul the six-ton stone over 100 kilometres. The discovery that the altar stone came from Scotland instead is a significant development opening new avenues for understanding the geology of megalithic monuments and consequently how we perceive our ancient ancestors. The most striking feature of Stonehenge and its sister site of Avery, located about 30 kilometres to the north, is the Chalk Downs landscape. While we often don't think of chalk as a rock, it is indeed a soft sedimentary rock, easily worked by Neolithic communities. The first construction projects by these early farmers were primarily mounds and ditches. Chalk is soft enough to be lifted with deer antler picks and shoveled with cattle collarbones, making it an ideal material for their monumental building needs. One of the earliest surviving examples of this kind of construction is the causeway enclosure at Windmill Hill, dating back about 5,700 years. Surrounded by a ditch and bank, this site covers about 20 acres, although time has filled in the ditches, diminishing the site's prominence. Evidence of past activity remains. Archaeological findings suggest that Windmill Hill was a place of gathering and feasting, with numerous stone tools unearthed there. The bright white chalk walls that define this enclosure were never defensive. The wide causeways over the ditch, making it open to all. Therefore, it's likely this space held cultural and symbolic importance, standing out vividly against the landscape, and possibly serving as a link to the ancestors of the people who built them. Exposed chalk, especially under moonlight, is an awe-inspiring sight. The gleaming white cliffs of Britain, which would have greeted the ancestors of these early farmers as they crossed the narrow channel, likely carried significant meaning. In later times, Greek and Roman writers described these cliffs as looming out of the Western Ocean like a fortress, marking the edge of the known world. The Greeks called this land Albion, a name derived from the word for white, in reference to the bright cliffs that symbolized Britain. For these classical cultures, Albion was not just a place, but a mythical land in the West, shrouded in mystery and a mist. Evidence suggests that the Neolithic farming community that built these monuments grew over the previous century or more. Windmill Hill was not a permanent settlement, but rather a festival space, with each family likely living in a farmstead or a village elsewhere. The site continued to be used for over 2,000 years. Similarly, the Stonehenge complex appears to have had its own causeway camp to the north, now hidden under a military base. And it demonstrates that both areas were hubs of human activity long before major construction projects began. Avery and Stonehenge are both situated in ideal spots for Neolithic agriculture. The rolling upland chalk of the Downs provided easy to cultivate soils and less dense woodland, attracting early colonists. In contrast, the Vale of Pisi, a valley between the two sites, was thickly wooded and with heavy clay soils was unsuitable for farming with the technology available at the time. If you wonder what the landscape looked like 6,000 years ago, it probably looked quite similar. More rolling grass downland for grazing animals, farmsteads dotted about, and small open fields of cereals and beans in strips because that makes for easy ploughing, and woodland copses dotted around which are on caps of clay and difficult to cultivate. The climate was generally warmer over the summer, with about an hour's extra daylight, but the winters were cooler. These geographical factors likely contributed to the development of these monumental sites. But they're also at the centre of a communication network of chalk ridges, 
that run mainly from the east and start at the White Cliffs of Dover. Stonehenge and Avery began as Henge monuments, a deep ditch and high bank without any stones. Now I'm going to avoid emotively loaded words like sacred or religious or ceremonial in descriptions because we don't know. But we can safely describe the space as being sapra. The height of the bank at Avery, particularly, suggests a desire to create a space that perhaps excluded the outside world. As a child visiting the area, I often wondered, where did the rocks come from? The landscape is chalk, with no mountains or rocky outcrops like those in Wales or northern England or Scotland. The nearest proper mountains, or rather rocky hills, are towards Bath at Barks. These great sarsen stones, weighing up to 40 tons, seem to have just appeared out of nowhere. One of the weirdest conspiracy theories is that Stonehenge is fake. Following World War II, Britain needed a psychological boost and the government set about creating a noble past for the inhabitants and constructed Stonehenge. And this conspiracy is based on the media from post-war reconstruction of the site. But the stones, sarsen stone, is concrete. It did not form from sediments that were compressed into stone deep underground and then pushed to the surface by great mountain building events. It formed as river sand and gravel on the surface with water and chemical action added to form great slabs or caps of concrete that eventually broke into pieces like crazy paving. Of course, all of this was natural. Sand is basically silica dioxide. Counterintuitively, water can dissolve rock, although very slowly. We can see it in places like the Blue Lagoon in Iceland, where a lot of silica dioxide is dissolved in the water because of heat and pressure, and then brought up into the power station, hence the blue colour. And it quickly precipitates out to form a white crust. Now, we shouldn't be surprised if hard, solid things can dissolve in water. If you live in the south of Britain, uh, you will be familiar with limescale. Limescale is hard, chalky, and consists mainly of calcium carbonate and calcium is a metal. Human made cement includes silica dioxide, and it's combined with calcium oxide, which is derived from chalk and limestone. It reacts with water to form calcium silicates, but all in a very short period of time. Sarsen formed on the surface, the groundwater over a huge period of time, allowed hydrogen to latch on to silica dioxide, which does then dissolved, and when the hydrogen was lost, other grains of sand cemented together with this binding agent, making it a fine, even grain rock. And it was ideal for shaping and used locally by farmers for grain grinding, stones for the fire, and for using as cooking stones. Stones heated in the fire and popped into pottery bowls to cook food. The chalk downs were formed during the later part of the Cretaceous period. Cretaceous means chalk between 166 million years ago, within a shallow sea that covered much of northwestern Europe. The rock is composed of microscopic skeletons, of plankton, algae with little armoured shells, and they continue to live in the seas today. The rate of deposition was slow, about a centimetre every thousand years, but over 40 million years it built up into thick bands of chalk. Some plants and animals, however, preferred dissolved silica to build their skeletons, the same material that cemented sand into sarsen stone, leading to the formation of flint within the chalk. So over a period of time, the silica in its dissolved form found cavities with more silica in, which would have been possibly things like sea cucumbers or sea, or sea sponges, where this gel-like material eventually turned into an incredibly hard rock. Flint was crucial to the Neolithic people in enabling them to develop the microlith technology that gave them a significant advantage. Flint and the similar chert that forms in a variety of sedimentary rocks and looks very similar look like a single crystal, but it has a microcrystalline structure that can only be seen with extreme magnification, and the structure allows it to be napped through fracturing into very sharp tools. Flint, being the most practical stone, was sought out across the world in chalk and limestone deposits that include Potiers in France, the chalk around Paris, chalk in Denmark and Germany, as well as Jordan and Egypt. 
and in the US, Ohio, there is the suitably named Flint Ridge. If flint could not be found, chert, which is similar, would be used, and elsewhere hard igneous rocks were used, and these were often preferred over flint for the ultimate utility tool of farmers, the hammer axe, or hammer and axe. Over millions of years, geological forces shaped the landscape of Salisbury Plain, raising the chalk seafloor during the Eocene and Oligocene periods to form low-lying tropical forests, and later broad river systems like the Nile and Colorado. The sand and gravel deposited by these ancient rivers eventually hardening into sarsen stone. The distribution of sarsen was not uniform, and in some areas, large stones were mixed with sand to form what is locally called pudding stone, resembling a Christmas pudding. So, during the slow continental collision between Africa and Europe that formed the Alps, southern England's chalk was pushed up into low mountains about 1,500 metres high. But being soft, it eroded quickly, leaving behind the north and south towns, which are sort of stumps of this mountain that we see today. 20 to 3 million years ago, during the Miocene, the climate was warmer and possibly wetter than today with large mammals roaming the chalk downs. As the climate got colder and the Ice Age began, the downs were a tundra, similar to Siberia, an icy steppe, Look at Blackthorn, which is common enough across the downs, and its great thorns seem overkill in its self-protection, sharp enough to penetrate the toughest leather gloves if you've ever had to prune one back. And the reason? Rhinos. Blackthorn evolved its protection to combat against grazing rhinos, which roamed the south of England. As the earth cooled, mega beasts we associate with the African savannah, although with woolly coats, such as the mammoth, lion, rhino, great deer and bear roam these hills. Of course, of course, with sea levels 120 metres lower during the height of the glaciation, southern England was just an extension of mainland Europe. And with these mega beasts being able to freely roam from the city isles across the wide valleys that are now the Irish Sea, the Bristol and English Channel. And explains how this chalkland, where water quickly is soaked up by the chalk, has so many dry valleys. During the summer, the ground remained frozen as permafrost, but the melting ice sheets further north flowed along with summer rain to create streams and rivers, carving out these valleys. It was during the 2.7 million years of the Ice Ages that the water undercut the caps of Sarsen, which broke under their own weight, and carried along in flood waters to form the landscape we see today. The Ice Age appears to have played a significant role in determining the location of Stonehenge. Excavations and geoarchaeological studies of the avenue reveal that it aligns with a natural glacial feature, straight lines etched into the chalk by the expanding and contracting permafrost over time. These periglacial patterns, as they're known, uh, include geometric shapes, and they seem to have guided the construction of the site. Remarkably, at the end of this natural pathway, the solstice sun could be observed rising. Here's one of my favourite facts. When the complete Stonehenge had been standing 800 years, on a small Siberian island, the last woolly mammoth died out. The Valley of Stones, about three kilometres from Avery, is one such place that these stones are scattered across the landscape. As a child, I marvelled at their presence, and I'm sure our Neolithic ancestors did too. Since the Ice Age broke up these rocks, rainwater has dissolved the stone, forming these curious little hollows. Weathered and covered in lichens, these stones were used as they were at Avebury. But yeah, this one didn't make the grade. So we did look at it. see that it was going to crack in the future. However, at Stonehenge, the architects shaped them, revealing the brilliant white quartz within. Walking back to Avery, I can't help but wonder at the sheer effort and organisation required to drag rocks weighing excess of 40 tonnes. Such monumental public works were not new. They'd been a generational endeavour long before the stones were transported across these downs. The first farmers arrived in this region about 6,000 years ago, and their earliest communal efforts across the British Isles and Ireland 
included the construction of communal tombs using massive sarsens in this area, or whatever material was available elsewhere. They also built the causeway camps that served as a hub for the communities and mysterious circuits of bank and ditch. Around 5,500 years ago, British and Irish colonies shifted from expanding outward to focus on building more established communities, including undertaking massive monumental projects. One of the earliest of these in Avery was the hand, the ditch and bank structure. Despite centuries of erosion and gradual filling of the ditch, the scale of this effort remains impressive. When completed, it would have enclosed a vast space, an amphitheater of sorts, with a great gleaming wall that obscured the view beyond, leaving only the sky visible above. Sometime later, around 5,100 years ago, the community at Stonehenge constructed their own Henge monument, which was smaller, with a more symbolic ditch and bank. They later added a stone circle with the Henge, sourcing their stones from the Priscilla Hills in Wales. As Neolithic farmers colonised the British Isles, they did so along two main routes. A seafaring group crossed from Brittany to Cornwall and travelled up the west coast as far as Orkney, while a land-based group crossed the Channel and settled in Wessex. The seafarers had the advantage of easy access to the entire length of the islands, whilst the Wessex settlers had ample space for expansion, oh, and flint as a raw material. Culturally, the seafarers had a head start, with cultural achievements reaching their heights in places like Bruna Boyne in Ireland, and Orkney. The people of Pembrokeshire constructed the spectacular Pentra Avan early around 5,500 years ago. Despite their evident success, the colony does not appear to have been large, judging by the scale of their other monuments. These early settlers lived on the hilltops, benefiting from the warmer climate, more fertile and less acidic soil, and the lightly wooded landscape when they first arrived. The period of Neolithic expansion coincided with the Holocene Maximum. Immediately after the Ice Age, the Northern Hemisphere received more sunlight in summer, about an extra hour, and this led to summers being about two degrees warmer compared to pre-industrial temperatures, allowing wheat to be grown as far north as Scotland. The winters were colder, as was the Southern Hemisphere. By the Bronze Age, the woodlands had largely disappeared here in Pembrokeshire, replaced by farmland. Pentra Ivan was constructed from the local hard metamorphite siltstone of the Ordovician period, while the bluestone used in stone circle monuments in the area is dolerite. It's an igneous rock that weathers into these distinctive crags and can be neatly shaped into obelisks. There was also a local axe factory where the dolerite was shaped and polished into axes. Now it seems that the Wessex community of Stonehenge failed its connection to the one at Priscilla. Possibly because Priscilla was one of the earliest colonies to settle in Britain, and its people were perhaps renowned for their early contribution to Neolithic culture. At Stonehenge, the 56 pits surrounding the inner henge, known as the Aubrey Holes, have been confirmed as the original locations for the bluestone. What makes this discovery even more fascinating is that fragments of human remains, burials, have been found at the bottom of some of these pits. This raises an intriguing possibility that the stones were erected to commemorate the dead, and added to this mystery, chemical analysis of some human rem remains found around Stonehenge indicates that some individuals grew up in West Wales. The 56 post holes originally holding bluestones, each of them about 3 metres in length, with 2 metres exposed above the ground and weighing approximately 2 tonnes, with an additional 24 stones, or the total to around 80. This remarkable feat has sparked countless theories and legends, one of which comes from the medieval fantasy writer Geoffrey of Monmouth. Geoffrey wrote of Ertha Pendragon, who, desiring to build a great monument, travelled west to Ireland to battle giants and bring back their stone circle, which was originally brought from Spain, to create Stonehead, with Merlin overseeing the project. While this might sound like an ancient folk memory, there is the possibility that Geoffrey, being a native of Wales, had some knowledge of the geological origins of the bluestone. 
It was not until 1920 that the geological origin of the blue stones was scientifically established. Transporting some 150 tons of stone whilst daunting was not beyond the capabilities of Neolithic people, who had a history of moving great weights over significant distances. For example, the largest menhir in Brittany, weighing over 300 tons before it collapsed and broke up, and several other menhirs exceed 100 tons, and these were erected 6,000 years ago. Moving a two-ton monolith, therefore, would not have been an insurmountable challenge. With sufficient manpower or oxen, it would have been possible to cover around 5 kilometers a day. Alternatively, transporting the stones by boat would have required less effort and manpower, although a modern attempt in 2000 ended in failure when the rocks sank in Milford Haven, just a mile from shore, a testament perhaps to the loss of such skills in modern times. The hypothesis that glaciers transported the bluestones, known as glacial erratic theory, is tempting. In Denmark, where suitable rock is not native, Vikings built their boat-like burial monuments using granite erratics, boulders carried and deposited by glaciers all the way from Norway, and they're scattered across the sandy landscape. Erratics, or strangers, are key evidence that help scientists understand the vast ice age. For instance, the Norbor erratics in Yorkshire, composed of Silurian grey wacky, a hard gritstone, was far from their parent rock carried by ice flow and deposited on a hill on limestone as the ice melted. Erratics are typically rounded by the action of ice and must be made of a hard rock, like granite or grey wacky, as softer rocks would have been pulverised into gravel and sand. The bluestone at Stonehenge could have similarly been plucked out by glacial action, rounded up and deposited at the edge of the ice flow as it receded. However, the last ice extent would have deposited these stones in South Wales, not near Stonehenge. Proponents of glacial movement often point to the Anglican glaciation, which occurred 480,000 years ago, as a possible source of the blue stones. Still, even this glaciation would only have moved the stones part way, perhaps to the Somerset levels. While it is conceivable that erratics might have been transported by ice, there are no other erratics found near Stonehenge. None have been covered during motorway construction or other earthworks in the area, or in Somerset. Although some bluestone boulders have been discovered near Swansea, it is only 60 kilometres southwest of the Presidi Hills, even if they had been carried to Somerset. There's still a significant distance of 70 kilometres that would still require human effort to move the stones. Now, complicating the matter, especially for the glacial erratic theory, is the discovery of the altar stone at Stonehenge, a six-ton rock that was transported an even greater distance. Atomic dating of the zircon crystals in the sandstone has established that the altar stone came from the Arcadian Devonian Old Red Sandstone, the same type of stone used by the stone circle of Stenes in Orkney. Now, there's no conceivable way this stone could have been brought down by glacial action, as the ice in the northeast of Scotland flowed northward, and the stone is simply too soft. It would have disintegrated during transport. Even if it had been somehow deposited closer to Stonehenge, it would still be needed to be moved 200 kilometers from the edge of the ice sheet at Norfolk. So why do a minority of geologists and geographers remain sceptical of the human transport theory. The most plausible explanation for the transport of these massive stones is that the Wessex people had a connection with distant colonies, possibly those in Orkney, who were revered for their expertise in monumental building. The Orkney community had been constructing such monuments for a longer period, and it's conceivable that the Stonehenge community might have employed an expert from Orkney to manage their project, and design the site. And this theory is supported by the fact that these monuments were clearly designed with intention and precision. They're not simply a random collection of stones. The belief that the blue stones and other exotic materials were deposited by glaciers stems from the assumption that Neolithic cultures were not capable 
of organizing the logistics required for such complex material handling. This view assumes that, as primitive farmers, these communities were ill-equipped to undertake such a challenging task. However, this underestimates the capabilities of these early societies. For example, the transportation of the altar stone, which would involve placing it on a sled and dragging it along a primitive roadway for approximately 900 or 1,000 kilometers, would require about 60 men and three months of work. While this would undoubtedly be a demanding task, it's not beyond the realms of possibility for a Stone Age community to accomplish. Personally, I favour the theory that the Blue Stones and the Altar Stone were transported by sea, using reed rafts rather than timber boats. Reeds, which are about 50% air, would have been a common material for thatching homes, and would have been ideal for constructing rafts. Reed boats are quick to make. They don't require a high level of skill to build and maintain, and can be easily adapted to fit the stone they are carrying. So, for instance, the six-ton altar stone could be transported on a simple reed raft measuring six meters by three and a half meters, and just half a meter thick. Such a raft could be towed by timber boats, which were commonly used by seafaring Neolithic farmers and it would require about half a dozen boats with 15 to 20 paddlers. Now, these communities would have been familiar with inshore waters, and the journey could have been undertaken over the summer, taking a couple of months to complete. The stones could be delivered directly from the quarry in Orkney, or south-east Scotland, and then transported up the Little River Avon to the end of the avenue at Stonehenge. The Avon is a shallow little river in this area, and making a reed raft ideal for the purpose. It's surprising that the idea of using reed rafts for sea transport hasn't been widely considered, especially since such methods were common elsewhere in the world at the time. However, the lack of surviving reed artefacts in the British climate might explain why this theory hasn't even been considered. The desire to import exotic rocks was not unique to Stonehenge. For example, the West Kennet Longborough, one of the earliest burial monuments dating back to around 5,600 years ago, hundreds of years before the Stone Circle and Henge at Avebury, contains not only Neolithic limestone sourced from the Cotswolds, some 30 kilometres to the northwest, but 22 kilograms of granite pebbles that come from the Cheviots in Northumberland, 480 kilometres away as the crow flies. Their value is a complete mystery. Similarly, in New Grange and Ireland, built around 5,300 years ago, features exotic stone chosen for decorative purposes, although these stones may have also carried symbolic value based on their place of origin. The site includes white fine crystal quartzite from an ancient Devonian beach which is found on top of the Wicklow Mountain, 70 kilometres to the south, and it's contrasted with black granite from the Mourne Mountains the youngest mountain in Ireland, located 70 kilometres to the north. Additionally, there are some dark grabro hobbles, which were sourced from the Cooley Mountains, about 50 kilometres to the north. The largest stones at Newgrange are grey wacky, sourced from the coast about 20 kilometres away. The tonnage involved in these ancient projects is staggering. Much of Newgrange is infilled with local gravel, but the large grey wacky stones vary in weight from a tonne to ten tonnes, while data on the exact quantity of quartzite transported over 70 kilometres is scarce. Now, doing a very rough estimation, that works out about 2,000 tonnes of quartzite. Even though they were cobbles, it remains an incredible example of project management. Once again, it makes far more sense to transport such materials via the sea and then up the Boyne River than manhandling it over land, even if an individual could carry 20 or more kilograms of rock in a knapsack and walk the distance. The Neolithic period, often referred to as the New Stone Age, marked a significant transition from the life of hunter-gatherer to a more settled agricultural society. This era was also the Golden Age for stone, as humans, who had been shaping stone tools for over a million years, reached new levels of sophistication. By the time Neolithic farmers arrived around 7,000 years ago, stone tools had become specialised and expertly crafted. 
toolmakers sought out the best geological sources for their material. At the earliest Causeway Camp Avery, stone axes were imported from Cornwall in the west, Kent in the east, and the Lake District in the north. The evidence is clear. Neolithic people were capable of organising complex societies with specialised skills. These include toolmaking and seafaring architecture and surveying. They maintain widespread communication networks. And there's evidence that people were very mobile, moving between communities and bringing new ideas and fresh genetic diversity, crucial to avoid inbreeding and societal stagnation. Stone monuments such as Avery and Stonehenge stand as a testament to the success of these communities. The larger the stones and earthworks, the more prosperous the community that built them. The very act of participating in the construction of these monuments would have bonded individuals to their community, which is a vital factor, especially as new members joined. Stonehenge remains an oddity among Neolithic monuments. If one were to begin studying stone circles and Henry monuments, Stonehenge would stand out as an outsider. It's an amalgamation of various themes and influences brought together in one unique site. It features the hen structure typical of Wessex sculptures and the simple stone circles common to the western seaboard. Whilst the Sarsen circle at Stonehenge shares traits with Avery, it has more in common with wood henges uh, associated with Wales and elsewhere as evidenced by the timber-like joints in the sarsen stones, which are an unnecessary feature given that the stone can rest under its own weight without additional support. If the original vision of the architects was to create a monument that embodied the very heart of British Neolithic culture, they achieved something extraordinary by uniting Welsh bluestone, or Cadian red sandstone, and sarsen stones of the Marlborough Downs within a chalk arena they crafted a cosmic world tree that bridged distant lands. It connected the earth and sky and entwined the past with the future. Stonehenge stands as a marvellous mystery, a statement to its creator's vision and ambition. And as we continue to uncover its links to far off regions in the north and west, our sense of wonder can only deepen. Stonehenge is more than a relic, it's a gateway to speculation and imagination, and that's a remarkable tribute to our Neolithic ancestors, who were not just farmers, but also master builders, organizers, and visionaries. But I like to think they also had a keen interest in geology too.